Okay, folks, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Russell Burke, and um, I'm a professor of biology at Hofstra University. And um, I've been asked to uh, talk to you all about uh, the research that my, my team has been doing uh, for pretty much the last 20 years. And uh, the title of this talk is uh, Turtles in Trouble. Uh, and um, I'm gonna ask you to hold off any questions that you've got uh, until the end. I think we're gonna keep everybody muted until the end. You can ask questions on the chat um, if you like, if you wanted to save your place, but I will probably not address them uh, until we get to the very end. And if we have time and, and conditions allow, I will, um, uh, we can unmute some people so they can actually talk in, in the more like the real world. Uh, thanks for joining me on this, um, this unusual format. Um, I've been teaching classes by Zoom for what, two weeks now, three weeks now, something like that. So Zoom is relatively new to me. It's, um, it's got some advantages. I'm probably talking to people that wouldn't be able to make it to a public talk. But it's got some disadvantages too. I don't get that that quick feedback from from an audience. So I hope uh, that it works out fairly well and and uh, that uh, this uh, turns out like like we all want it to. So I'm going to go ahead and get started, um, and I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so you can see the uh, PowerPoint that I want to use here. All right, let's see if they do that. Very good. And let's see, move some of these windows around. There we go. All right. So as I said, I'm going to talk to you about uh, what I call turtles in trouble and just to spread the alliteration along a little bit more. We're really going to be talking almost entirely about terrapins today, which is a specific kind of turtles. And um, uh, yeah, I'm a professor of biology at, at Hofstra University. So I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about diamondback terrapins, the turtles that uh, we're going to talk about the, this time. Um, they're really, really special turtles, and, and I pretty much consider myself to be uh, new to terrapins because I've only been studying them for 20 years. Um, um, before that, I studied other kinds of turtles, and uh, diamondback terrapins turn out to be extraordinarily cool turtles for, for tons and tons of reasons, more than we have time to go into right here. But first, I want to point out that, um, you know, some of the most exceptional things about these uh, wonderful animals. Um, what you're seeing there in the picture is uh, uh, that's a female right there. That's an adult female and that's an adult male. So um, there's really, really big sexual size dimorphism in this species. Um, that's as big as males gets and that's about as big as females get. They're not really, really huge turtles. You can see there's one person holding two turtles there. But um, nevertheless, they are, they are um, you know, they're certainly smaller turtles as well. If you look at those back feet there on both the male and the female, there's the female's back feet and there's the male's back feet. You can see that they're really, really well adapted for swimming um, uh, in, uh, in the, even in strong currents. In fact, these guys are great swimmers uh, and they're very fast and they can swim long distances. And if you look at the, uh, the female here especially, you can see this big bulge right there behind her head or in the back of her head there, that's muscles. Uh, and they are also really strong biters. Um, and that's largely because they eat um, uh, invertebrates like snails and clams and things like that. And they have to crush through those shells. And um, I can tell you from personal experience, they have um, quite a strong bite. Uh, and so uh, generally you want to uh, avoid being bitten by these guys. But they're usually pretty docile, easy to handle. And um, despite the fact I've handled many thousands of terrapins, I've only been bitten a few times. Uh, one of the other exceptional things about diamondback terrapins is they, they live in salt marshes. Um, and uh, these are the, the, the uh, tall grass prairies of the ocean. Uh, they uh, occur along the coastlines and um, they're where the salt water from the ocean meets the fresh water from streams and rivers coming off the land. And so they live in this brackish water that's a mix of salt and fresh water. Um, these are extraordinarily uh, productive areas, lots and lots of, uh, of photosynthesis here, lots and lots of, uh, of very active plant life. They, this place like what you're seeing right here would get flooded at high tide every day or twice a day and would be drained and exposed like you see it there at low tide every day. And those, um, the terrapins swim around those marshes. They swim through the marshes when they're on, uh, in water and they swim uh, just outside them when the tide is out. 
and they those marshes that they I call them the Atlantic Coast marshes because they occur all the way from um, just uh, right around the, the east end of uh, Massachusetts here all the way down the Atlantic coast into the Gulf of Mexico and all the way almost to the uh, edge of Texas where it meets up with Mexico. So this is a species that occurs almost along the, our entire east coast, um, but it does not go inland much at all, just along the coastline because they never get very far from salt water. So they live in an, an environment that no other turtles live in, um, which is another reason that they're really uh, exceptional creatures. Uh, terrapins have had um, um, a really interesting set of relationships with people, uh, probably more so than nearly any other reptile in the United States. Uh, for one thing, uh, people have always lived along the coastlines in, the in, in what we now call United States. Uh, Native Americans lived along the coastlines and they harvested all sorts of things that they could find along to eat along the, way, along the coast. And they certainly must have eaten large numbers of terrapins. When Europeans arrived here, they uh, took up that tradition and they ate lots of terrapins as well. We don't know much detail about any of that, but certainly um, it's very reasonable to expect that people have been eating terrapins here for a really long time. That ramped up to a huge extent in the late 1800s through the 1930s, when all of a sudden terrapins became very, very popular as a food item here in the United States. Uh, so lots more people started eating terrapins in, in that time period. And you can see lots of evidence of that. For one thing, terrapins became so valuable that uh, people started farming them in uh, parts of the south, southern United States. And down here, you see a terrapin farm um, where uh, people are raising terrapins in these big pens outside. It only made uh, maybe even a little bit of sense to do that when terrapins are worth a great deal of money. Otherwise, it's not very economical to do it. And terrapins were collected all over the East Coast uh, and shipped all over the world. Here's a market in, in uh, Chicago where uh, there are barrels of terrapins being shipped um, to, uh, in this case, to Chicago. And um, so, you know, the terrapins were worth so much for, the, for food that uh, people were collecting them in gigantic numbers and shipping them all over the world, especially all over the United States. And here you can see a guy uh, inspecting a couple of the terrapins uh, that are being shipped. And it even made it into that they were even in the pet trade. Here's a little clipping from a 1930s newspaper advertising ter hatchling uh, turtles for 25 cents. And although they don't say terrapin, that is certainly a terrapin in that drawing there. Um, so terrapins were harvested really, really, really heavily uh, all over, the, uh, you know, throughout their range. And um, there's no doubt that their numbers declined dramatically because of this. This phase uh, ended about the same time as prohibition came to an end, and uh, uh, terrapins are not eaten in nearly these kinds of numbers anymore. So the massive harvesting that took place in that time period has really mostly come to an end. Um, throughout that period as well, um, their home has been really, really modified by lots of people, um, uh, starting with steam sh uh, shovels that, that dug up marshes and, and put soil over marshes and, and covered up terrapin home, to um, the diesel and then modern uh, equipment as well. Uh, terrapin, the marshes the terrapins live in have been very, very badly damaged for uh, hundreds of years as people have modified them to use them for other things. And even today, um, uh, we have lots of problems. Terrapins still face lots of problems. There's still ongoing marsh loss uh, throughout the eastern United States, which harms terrapin habitat. Uh, terrapins get caught in crab traps. This is a crab trap right here. Certainly, it was set originally for crabs. But if, uh, if they're not tended very regularly, the terrapins that go inside of them can drown. And this is actually a, a picture from Jamaica Bay where a large number of terrapins drowned after uh, and were found in a, in a pot that had been abandoned. Um, we often build roads very near the shorelines and terrapins get hit when they cross roads. And in some places, that's a really major source of, of mortality. Um, it's a very, very serious problem. And in addition, we don't know much in the way of details, but we strongly suspect that pollution of various kinds harms terrapins as well. So uh, while we don't harvest terrapins in any great number anymore for food, we still have a lot of, terrapins still have a lot of problems. Now, terrapins are actually really important species. They matter a lot to humans. Uh, for one thing, 
Uh, terrapins eat a lot of different kinds of uh, invertebrates, like I said, snails and crabs and clams and things like that. And they tend to be pretty picky. They favor some species of uh, food over other species, and that changes what's out there. And in some cases, that makes a really big difference. Uh, terrapids also um, collect up, you know, take all that, those nutrients and everything that they uh, get from eating, and they bring it up on land and lay eggs. And although it's certainly not their intention, um, that ends up being really important to a lot of animals that live on land that require those eggs or, or, or uh, depend on those eggs to uh, keep their populations going. So the eggs and the hatchlings are eaten by many different predators. And here's just a very short list. Uh, and I'm gonna talk more about that in just a couple of minutes. Now, terrapins have just recently uh, become protected in nearly every state where they exist now all along that coastline. Um, uh, so every state has their own little, uh, has their own protections. Here in New York, uh, where I live, it is illegal to catch native species without a permit to begin with. And on top of that, terrapins get some special permission. The harvest of terrapins for food is prohibited. Um, and uh, in many cases, we require terrapin excluders to be put on crab pots. So when anybody is setting up uh, traps to catch crabs, they're required to put this little device uh, right around the mouth of the, of the trap so that it makes it much more difficult for terrapins to get in. And this is a technique that has proven very effective in other states uh, to reduce the number of terrapins that are caught in traps and uh, it can really, really, really be beneficial. Um, one of the uh, leading international conservation organizations, the IUCN, considers terrapins to be threatened, um, and that is because of the really severe loss in numbers that they had back there in the 1930s and the rather poor the recovery they've had in most places after that. And then we still have these ongoing threats, as I just mentioned. So I'm going to tell you, focus the rest of my time uh, here talking about um, our particular research project. And um, I've been working, in, my team and I have been working in Jamaica Bay. Uh, Jamaica Bay is a, um, is a national wildlife, uh, uh, well, it's a national re recreational area. Um, and you can see that um, uh, this is a, a big bay here. It's 14, uh, 14 miles across. And um, uh, JFK, J. John F. Kennedy Airport is right over here, so some of you will be familiar with that. And there's Brooklyn over here and Queens over here. This is really a very, very urban site. So uh, any of you who are familiar with New York City, uh, you might even know this area, you might have been through this area. Um, the road that you could kind of see right here, that's uh, Cross Bay Boulevard. This is the A train line, goes right through here, right across the bay. Uh, and this is Rockaways out here. So this is pretty a pretty fairly well-known area to a lot of people. The green, the dark green areas that you see here, these are all owned by the National Park Service. Uh, they actually control the waterways as well as the land that you see demarked in dark green. So a lot of this land is uh, owned and maintained by the National Park Service. The lighter green is uh, mostly parkland that's um, uh, owned and managed by the city of New York. And everything within this dotted red line here is the Jamaica Bay Parks boundary. Um, we do almost all of our work with some exceptions that I'll tell you about here on this main island in the middle of the bay. It's called Ruler's Bar. Some people call it Ruler's Bar Hassock. The white area here in the south is actually a town and the rest of it here in the dark green, as I said before, is all national park. So we focus on this island right here in the center for a whole bunch of reasons. One of them is that it's really, really to get to. As I said, there's a road that comes there and goes on across, and there's also a subway. And in addition to that, a lot of terrapins nest right in this area right here. We've actually looked at all the other areas around Jamaica Bay, spent some time looking for nesting, and there is some nesting in other areas, but not nearly as much as there is at Ruler's Bar, with one exception, which I'll talk to you about a little later on. Now, Jamaica Bay is a particularly interesting place to work, um, again, for a wide number of reasons. One is that it's a, it's a bay it's a, uh, that has had a really long history of pretty bad pollution, of nearly every kind of pollution that humans are involved with um, is detectable in Jamaica Bay, and sometimes in very high levels. So in the past, before pollution was regulated, lots and lots of companies and factories and hospitals 
and, uh, uh, and residences and everybody dumped their, their pollutants directly into Jamaica Bay. And so um, while well, that's been strongly regulated since then, and Jamaica Bay is much, much, much cleaner than it used to be, uh, it still has had a pretty long history of pollutants. And turtles live long enough that many of them may have experienced much higher pollution levels than they do right now. So that's an interesting thing from my point of view. I'm interested in knowing how urban turtles uh, survive and how they compare to turtles that live in areas that perhaps are less polluted. In addition, Jamaica Bay has undergone a huge amount of marsh loss. Um, there used to be lots more marshes than there are right now. Uh, this is a, a, a picture of a, one particular island in 1974, and this is the same island in 1999. Um, there's a lot of uh, dispute about what causes this marsh loss, but in any case, these marshes are super important to the terrapins. That's where they live. That's where their food is. And so the loss of the marshes is certainly uh, very, very important. And that's another thing that I'm particularly interested in knowing about. Uh, another last thing that I wanted to mention about what makes Jamaica Bay such a great place to work is that um, there was work done in Jamaica Bay on the terrapins way back in the early 1980s. So even you know, decades before we got started, there were Park Service people who were, who were doing a little bit of work on terrapins. And what caught my attention is that they noticed that the egg survivorship, that is the, the eggs that the turtles laid, had really, really, really high survivorship, practically unknown in turtles for survivorship as high as 93%. They never saw predators uh, uh, eating the eggs. In fact, they did some sensitive at the time, they found no uh, mammal predators uh, there at all. And that's quite exceptional for turtle populations, almost every place. Turtle eggs are, are favorite foods of lots of animals. And so um, this is a really interesting thing to think about a, time, a place where egg survivorship might be very, very high. So we started working in Jamaica Bay in uh, 1998. Uh, one of my very first graduate students uh, pretty much discovered it as far as I'm concerned. Um, and we've been doing that work ever since. We've been conducting annual work ever since. Um, we, we do what I like to call basic population ecology, and we're asking questions like, how many terrapins are there in Jamaica Bay? What are the things that affect uh, the number of terrapins? What is the population going up or is it going down? And how are these populations differ from the populations of terrapins in other places? We're very fortunate that lots of other people study terrapins in other parts of their range. So it's pretty uh, easy to compare some of the things that we do to what other people are finding in more natural areas. And just to give you a bit of a focus, we're looking at the eggs, we're looking at the hatchlings, we're interested in the sub-adults and, and the juveniles, we're interested in the adults, and we're primarily interested in things like how well do they survive and what affects their reproduction. So on a, day, on a yearly basis, every summer, we do what most people who do population ecology do. We spend a lot of time outside and we're looking at walking around, looking for turtles, uh, looking for um, you know, anything relevant to the turtles. We look primarily for that thing right there, which you're seeing, we're looking for nesting females. Generally, we're looking for nesting females, turtles that have come on shore to lay their eggs. When we find a nesting female, we, uh, we hide and wait where we can see her and hopefully she can't see us. And we wait till she gets done nesting. We want her to cover her nest, all, do all the things she would naturally do if we weren't there. And then when she's all done, before she escapes back into the ocean, we will run up, dash up there and grab her and uh, collect some measurements, do some other things here. What you're seeing me do here is injecting a small identification tag into the terrapin so that the next time we catch her, we'll know which turtle this is. This is something we've been doing since the beginning. It means that uh, many, many, almost all the terrapins uh, at our study site are, are already marked, so we know who they are. We almost never come across new turtles anymore because we've been doing this for so long. We also measure all the turtles. Um, uh, and uh, uh, collect other information about the turtles, whether they look healthy, whether uh, they've got all their parts, you know, uh, what size they are, all those sorts of things. Um, then we'll go back to where the nest was laid, and what we do then depends on what kind of projects we're working on that year. So sometimes 
will do nothing but mark where that nest is and just leave it alone and, and completely uh, leave it undisturbed. We might come back uh, the next day uh, or every day through the rest of the season. And very often what we see is what you see right here. We're gonna see the nest with the eggs all dug up. And that means that a predator came by and ate the eggs and left the eggshells behind. We see that very commonly. We also see uh, sometimes we are interested in collecting information about the eggs themselves. And when we do that, we uh, will dig up the nest and uh, count the eggs or measure the eggs. Uh, very often, um, we'll put a, a cage around the nest so that the uh, so no predators can get in it. Because if we want to look at at, at uh, any the uh, anything to do with hatching, we have to keep the predators out. So we use predator excluders to keep those out. And when we do that, we come along later uh, around the time of the year when the eggs hatch, and we can catch hatchlings uh, coming out of the out of the nest. And we mark and measure those, and then we can let those go as well. So now I'm going to switch to talking about the sorts of things that we found over the years. And before I do, I just want to say that I've had a really wide range of students and other colleagues working with me. A lot of times in the pictures that I show you, you're going to see somebody off to the side. And that's the particular student uh, who worked on that, on, on that project. And I'm just going to touch on a smattering of the projects we've worked on over the years, just to give you an idea what some of these things are. So one thing we've done is um, explored uh, temperature sex determination. It turns out that in uh, terrapins, like in many turtles, the temperature that the eggs incubate at determines whether those eggs become boy uh, turtles or girl turtles. So we've looked at a lot of nests and collected temperature data on those nests to, to figure out what, uh, what, they're gonna, what they would be. And one thing that we found is that the eggs, the nests at, at, our, our, at our nesting site have a very strong female sex ratio bias. In other words, most of the nests that, we, uh, that we've looked at are producing mostly female uh, uh, hatchlings. Uh, like I said, we have done some work following hatchlings and I uh, can't get into all of that right here, but I've had several students work on those. We've worked out ways to uh, mark the hatchlings so that we can track them. And we found out lots of, lots of really interesting things about those hatchlings. For one thing, we've tracked hatchling movements during the year, and we find that hatchlings move in two big pulses every year. There's a spring pulse that will be gearing up uh, fairly soon in another few weeks. We'll start to see hatchlings moving around in the spring. And then we see another big pulse in the fall. Those hatchlings in the fall are mostly animals that are recently emerging from the, egg, from the nest and moving around on land. We've discovered that those hatchlings move off into places on the land, they dig, dig another hole, and they spend their first winter on land instead of going to the water like other turtles do. Um, we focused a lot on nesting ecology, um, and we've, we've learned that uh, terrapins lay as many as three clutches of eggs in one year, so each female can lay up to three clutches in one year. We don't know much about how many lay one, how many lay two, and how many lay three. We just know that some lay as many as three. The nesting season here in, in New York is pretty much uh, completely in June and July. Usually within the first few days of June, we get started. And usually about the third week of July, we, we finish up. And uh, uh, the terrapins are very regular. Almost never do we go beyond that. We've learned that uh, uh, if we don't protect the nests, uh, raccoons can eat 93 to 98% of the nests. And uh, so uh, and just about any nest that we don't put a cage on is taken by raccoons. Now, you may remember that I mentioned earlier on that uh, the Park Service people said in the early 1980s that uh, almost all of their eggs got, uh, got uh, survived and uh, they had almost no predation. That's a very different story now. Uh, raccoons have invaded the island a couple of different ways, we think, and now they are eating uh, nearly all of the nests. We've learned some things about the way the raccoons work, and, and uh, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about that, but that's been a big focus of our, of our research. Well, we've learned that nearly all of the nests that raccoons predate, um, they predate in the first night or second night after the eggs were laid, and that if a nest can survive to its third night or fourth night, then it's almost certainly going to avoid being eaten by predators. So uh, those first few nights are the really dangerous ones. After that, the, and the nest can be pretty safe. 
And kind of tied to that, we've learned that predation rates are also strongly influenced by rainfall. If it rains really hard soon after a nest is laid, then the chances are very good that the raccoons will not find that nest. And I think these two findings tie together very closely. I think the reason that raccoons uh, can't find, I'm gonna go back here a second, that can't find the very old nest, the nests that are three or four or five or older days old, is because the smell from the nest is gone. The, the, when the nest is newly laid, it has a particular odor. And uh, after the uh, first couple of days, that odor dissipates, it goes away, and the raccoons can't find it again. And in the same sense, if it rains right after a nest is laid, then uh, raccoons have a hard time finding the smell, and those nests are much uh, more likely to survive as well. Now, those are kind of short-term things. I wanna also talk about some of the longer-term things that we found. And one of the longer-term things is that the number of nests that are being laid at our study site has been declining very rapidly. Now, here's data from uh, 1999 when uh, we first started collecting this particular kind of data uh, until uh, about 2012. And, the re and um, what we show here is that the number of nests has gone from a little over 2,000 to just a little bit over 1,000. In other words, the number of nests that are being laid there are, are declining rapidly. And so there could be a lot of reasons for that, but certainly that means that um, there has to be many, many fewer hatchling uh, turtles making their way into the water because there's so many fewer nests. Now, before I talk too much more about those, those declines in the nests, I wanna talk about another subject. And that is uh, the big surprise that we had in the summer of 2009. So in 2009, uh, all of a sudden we were surprised to get, uh, to see news reports uh, that turtle, the terrapins were turning up at JFK Airport. Now you may remember, I showed you earlier on, the JFK Airport is in the Northeast part of Jamaica Bay. And we had actually heard from other people years earlier than this, that there were very, very, very few terrapins there. So we hadn't really paid any attention to what was going on at the airport. But in 2009, it was like an invasion. Um, and there were news reports popping up all over the place um, as the Terrapins started walking across the runways at the airport. And that meant that planes had to slow down or couldn't take off because of this. And people, the, the passengers in the planes took pictures out there, out, there, out their windows. They tweeted all over the place. There were lots and lots of news stories with pictures like this one of trucks, uh, uh, at airport trucks filled with Terrapins. They had taken off the runways. There were even photographs like this um, uh, 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 news stories, and some of you turtle people out there might get a laugh out of this because, of course, you will recognize these are not terrapins at all, but another species of turtles. These are these are uh, red-eared sliders, but the news people apparently don't, didn't know the difference. But nevertheless, something big happened in 2009, and uh, it caught us totally by surprise. So just to give you a little bit of context for that, um, this is the study site that I have been telling you about. Again, this is Rulers Bar, that island right there in the center of Jamaica Bay. And most of our research has been here on the west side of Rulers Bar. But over here on the east side, that's where JFK is. And that's where the, I mean, that's where the airport is. And most of the runway uh, invasions have been right along in here and along the shoreline runways here. Um, that's a pretty good distance. And, uh, but still, it certainly seemed to us that some of our terrapins might be moving over there and deciding that JFK looked like a good place to hang out. So we did a little, we started working with the people at the airport. It turns out that the airports, just like every other airport, uh, has a whole team of wildlife biologists and they had a lot of data uh, over the years on terrapins going way back before 1999. And I'm showing two kinds of data right here, the number of terrapins that they've moved off of runways, because the airport biologists, they keep all sorts of records and all sorts of things. So over the years, they have before uh, had terrapins on runways, which they've had to move off the runways. They've also had terrapins, that, unfortunately, that were occasionally hit on the runways. And that's the data that I'm showing you here in red. You can see that they overlap a lot. In other words, all from, from even before uh, 2009, they had terrapins occasionally on runways, small number of terrapins. But then in 2009, right about here, the number started going up 
and then it kept on going up higher and higher and higher even after 2009 in 2010, 2011, and I don't have all the other data on here, but it's continued to, to go up uh, more or less since then. So something very surprising happened back there in 2009, and they've started encountering very large number of terabits there. Now, we shouldn't be terribly surprised about this in one sense. Um, there, you know, lots of airports uh, uh, have planes that occasionally hit wildlife. In fact, there's over 6,000 uh, wildlife strikes per year in the United States, but almost all of those are birds. And some of you will remember this famous picture of a plane that took off from LaGuardia Airport and then hit some geese and landed in the Hudson River. So we, we know that wildlife and, and aircraft regularly interact and it's often not very good for the wildlife and often sometimes very bad for the airplanes as well. But like I said, almost all of those strikes have to do with birds. Reptiles are actually very rare. Um, there's only 18 uh, reptile species that uh, have records of being hit by planes. 13 of those are turtles. Of those, uh, diamondback terrapins are the most frequently struck reptiles. There, there were 43 strikes recorded at JFK uh, in one year. Um, and um, that was 20% of all turtle strikes and 17% of all reptile strikes. So JFK is uh, pretty exceptional in that um, there have been a large number of turtle strikes at that one airport. So again, let's, let's look at the bigger picture here. Um, like I said, we uh, started working with the wildlife biologist at, uh, at the airport and they started marking terrapins in very much the same way as we've been marking terrapins at, at our study site. They st we've got data from them from 2011 all the way up to 2017 here. They've marked a total of 2,665 terrapins. To get a handle on that and that same uh, in our entire uh, uh, project up to 2017, we've marked less than half of that. So clearly there's a really big population of terrapins at the airport that we really didn't know anything about. Now, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, we thought it was possible that some of the terrapins that we marked over at Ruler's Bar over here, let's see, there we go, over here, were swimming over to the airport. Maybe that's where some of our missing turtles were going. But it turns out that since they tag their turtles and we tag our turtles, it's pretty easy to see what's going on. And in fact, only a few turtles have moved between the two populations. So only three of the terrapins that we've marked ended up over at the airport. And only seven of the terrapins that they marked at the airport ended up nesting with us. So there's very, very little exchange between the two populations. Now, because we've been collecting data for a long time on both of these populations now, we can actually do some pretty cool population analysis. And so what I'm showing you here is the annual survival rates for, uh, the, for female turtles in the two populations. Unfortunately, what we see here is that the survival rate, that is the number of turtles that survive year to year, has been declining dramatically uh, in the ruler's bar population. And it's gone from 0.92% uh, from 92% survivorship down to 86% survivorship. So these are declining with survivorships for sure. At the same time, their JFK animals have been holding very nice and steady at 91% survivorship. And if we zoom in on this and look a little more closely, we see a big decline for a couple of years in the survivorship for the ruler's bar animals. And that turns out to be associated with Hurricane Sandy. So right after, for the two years after Hurricane Sandy hit Jamaica Bay, the terrapins in the ruler's bar population took a big hit in survivorship, but the, the JFK animals were unaffected. We've also noticed that the ruler's bar animals have really high rates of shell damage. There's a lot of uh, major shell damage with these animals. And here's one of the most exceptionally damaged animals we've seen. This is all scar tissue on the back of the shells. And that also happened right around the same time as, as Sandy. Some of it a little before, but a lot of it after. We're really not sure what caused these damages, but we have lots of different kinds of damage. So a fairly high percentage of the animals at Willers Bar have these kinds of major injuries. And that also contributes to their low survivorship. The animals with, low survive, with, low, with lots of injuries also have lower survivorship than the general population. So what I'm showing you here are the population trends, that is the number of animals over time 
Uh, we have lots more data on the Rouge bar animals. That's the ones I'm showing you here in blue. The uh, error bars here are 95% confidence intervals. We have very, very good confidence on all of these. That's why you can't say the interval marks on these because they're bunched up on the points. But over the years that we've been studying the ruler bar, ruler's bar animal, we've seen a 36% decline in the number of animals. That's about 2.6% 2, 2 per year. So this is a population that is in a very steady decline and is on its way out. Uh, the JFK population, on the other hand, is much less steady. It's been all over the place, up and down. But overall, uh, the years that we've been studying it so far, it's really held very constant. The earliest ca calculation we have is for 3,327 animals. And in 2017, 2018, I'm sorry, we had, it was still at 3,300 animals. So basically, that's a stable population. So 20 years of research has shown us that, um, that quite surprisingly, we have very, very different survival rates in two populations of turtles that are right next door to each other. We don't really know why they're so different, even though they're so close to each other. But I will point out that the marshes around Ruler's Bar, the places where those terrapins probably live, have been declining steadily. The marshes there are in really bad shape. And the marshes around the airport are actually in pretty good shape. They're some of the best marshes in Jamaica Bay. And it could be so that the local habitat around the populations are really what matters. We have low survival of the females in the Rivers Bar population and a significant decline. And uh, we also know that we have really high nest mortality there. We don't have as good data on nest mortality over the JFK population, so you don't really know for sure what's going on there. Uh, we do know that there's a survival decline associated with Hurricane Sandy and that the increased uh, injury rates that we see at the ruler's bar animals suggest that there's uh, something else special going on there that's a real problem. So just to summarize, we have a pretty good handle on what's going on in terms of egg and nest survivorship at ruler's bar, not so much at JFK. We have a pretty good understanding of what happens with hatchlings after they survive, uh, after they come out of the nest and how they overwinter their first winter, but not much after that for a little while. We have a pretty good handle on adult female survivorship. That's the data I've just been showing you. But we don't, we still have some really major questions that we're trying to uh, explore. So um, some of those questions that we expect to spend uh, maybe the next 20 years learning about is we really want to fill in the gaps in what we know about the effects of pollutants on terrapins. So we've been collecting a lot of data on things like heavy metals and persistent organic pollutants. And uh, we'll be uh, uh, presenting some of that kind of work, for, uh, finishing some of that work up in the next couple of years. And we've really started a major project um, going out into the bay and trapping terrapins. Those same uh, crab traps that uh, sometimes catch terrapins and drown them. You can also use them and not drown terrapins and actually catch a large number of terrapins. So we've been, um, we actually had planned to do start our trapping project this summer. It looks like we'll probably have to put it off till next summer. But we expect to um, get seriously into trapping uh, terrapins all over Jamaica Bay. And we, we may spend quite a number of years doing that. We're also expanding our, our uh, censusing um, to use some less intensive censusing, but also some really interesting new techniques. We're looking at censusing. We're going to uh, try using some indirect methods with uh, some parasites that terrapins have. Uh, we also plan to use kayaks to find to count terrapins by uh, using binoculars. And then we're really interested in some new technology that uses drones to, ter to census terrapins uh, in the marshes where they live. Now I'm gonna finish up by talking about, uh, just mentioning that um, this has been a gigantic project over the last 20 years, and uh, an enormous number of people have helped with this project. Um, this slide is, uh, is only a small fraction of the people who've helped out. Uh, lots and lots and lots of people have contributed to this over the years, and uh, I wanna thank each and every one of them. And so what I'd like to do at this point, I think I'm gonna stop the share of, uh, of my slides. And maybe, uh, maybe I can uh, see if I've got any questions by chat. Let's see if I can, um, let's see if I could start at the top here and work our way down. Okay, there's not too many, so we can do that. Okay, so um, uh, Abby asked if the chemical burns from the overflow at the porta potty place in Broad Channel could be an important uh, could, could be a source of the uh, uh, chemical burns. 
And uh, I'll tell you, we were stumbling over what it could be for a long time because those burns, those that injured terrapin I showed you looked so strange. I showed it to a lot of other turtle people and, and nobody really had any clues. And then somebody the other day, uh, well, uh, last year actually, suggested something that hadn't occurred to me at all. And it, I realized they could be right. Those could be bleach burns. Those could be bleach, you know, chlorine. And uh, I know, uh, I've been told, I guess I don't know, I've been told that when uh, sometimes sewage treatment plants flush a lot of chlorine out of their, out of their facilities, uh, and also I know that the uh, that, uh, uh, porta potty places sometimes flush uh, chlorine out when they're cleaning things. So uh, I, I tend to think that it's possible that's what it is. I really doubt that I'll ever be able to answer the question for sure, but um, I think it is possible that those are chlorine burns. Um, we only saw them, Initially, that one year, you know, occurring that one year right after sand, we have not seen fresh ones since then. And I'm happy to say that some of those turtles that we initially saw burned like that um, have been, we've caught later, and they're healing up quite nicely. So it is certainly not necessarily uh, mean that they died, even though uh, it was really, really terrible um, uh, burns. Okay, so uh, Karen asked if maybe the planes are scaring away the predators. Um, that's certainly possible. Um, I think it's more likely that, um, you know, the airports are very carefully managed properties. Um, the people, the wildlife biologists at the airport work pretty hard at keeping the number of wildlife down so that our planes don't get into trouble. And um, that probably reduces like the raccoon populations because they do that. So uh, that could be, uh, you know, any combination of those things might be important. Okay, I'm gonna keep working my way down the list. Uh, somebody who's calling themselves mom uh, asked um, uh, if um, if I might be interested in expanding our research to uh, to a spot in Orchard Beach. Um, it's possible. Uh, part of the problem is, you know, that my my general approach has always been that um, I'd like to do I, I'd rather do a pretty good job at a small area than a than a poor job in a larger area. So um, I have I really resisted expanding out because you know. I, there's, you know, we have limited resources and I can't do everything. But um, it is possible that uh, there might be some, uh, some way to spread out and add some more studies to that. Adding JFK was really easy for us because they had their own team of people who could take over, uh, take over the pro you know, do their end of the project. So um, uh, I've got one from Siha who asked, um, do terrapins return to the same the site every year to lay eggs? And they kind of do, many times they do, but it's certainly true that they also, at least occasionally, will move to new places and start nesting there. So um, we have plenty of evidence that terrapins will usually go to the same spot, but not always go to the same spot. Okay, so I'm continuing to work down my list here, guys. Let's see how far we get. Uh, Kaylee asked, um, how often does it take females to reach maturity? Um, I can't really say uh, with much certainty about that, but I think we're in the neighborhood of six, six or seven years. Um, and uh, something in that neighborhood, maybe a little earlier in some cases and a little later in other cases, it's probably a matter of body size. If you get a, a turtle that, you know, found lots of food when it was young and can grow really fast, they probably mature a little younger. And if they don't end up finding a lot of food and they grow a little more slowly, they probably mature a little later but probably in the neighborhood of six or seven years for the most part. Okay, so Steve Collins um, uh, is asking about uh, studies in Suffolk County. There's, uh, there's some really neat stuff starting up in Suffolk County. It's been going on for a couple of years now. Um, a, a number of teams are looking for um, good places where terrapins nest, where they uh, might need some protection. Uh, to get some ideas about um, uh, places where terrapins might need help. And um, so um, there's some really neat stuff going on in Suffolk County right now um, uh, along the same lines of, this, of the same things we're doing. So Julian asks, how do terrapins know where? Um, and um, that's, that's a tough one to say. Um, I'll tell you, I have followed terrapins um, after we let them go into the water, after they've nested, I followed them in a kayak just to see where they go. And they swim out into the water a little ways, and then they lift their heads up above the water, and they look around with their heads above the water. They look around, and it's like they're looking for landmarks. You know, there's that uh, big island over there, and there's that building way over there. And then they go back down, and they swim some more. 
So I'm pretty sure that they can see landmarks even pretty far away if the landmarks on the shore. And that's part of what they're doing to figure out where they want to go. All right, man, the questions are piling up. These are fantastic, guys. Okay. Okay, so uh, Kevin asked the question, at what age uh, do we start putting the, the uh, marking tags, their, their pit tags, into the hatchlings? Um, we actually worked out a technique for adding pit tags to hatchlings right out of the nest. And if you're interested, um, you could email me about that and I can give you some details. We, we actually published a little note on how to do that. It's, you have to do it differently than you do with, um, with adults, of course, because they're much, much smaller. But the smaller tags actually could go in the hatchlings and, uh, and that's really cool stuff um, that allowed us to do some work that we otherwise wouldn't be able to do. Okay, let's see. Um, oh, we've got some experienced people, uh, people uh, here. So Carol asked uh, about pit tabbing, tagging map, map turtles and soft shells. And again, Carol, if you'll email me, um, I will be glad to fill you in on details. We have a note that we published in Herp Review some years ago that, would, uh, that I think will answer your question. And it seemed to work pretty well. Um, and Casey wanted to know how we mark the turtles. So um, uh, let's talk a little bit more about the marking. I have mentioned it a couple of times, but we use um, the things that we're calling pit tags. These are the exact same tags that if you've got a dog or a cat that your, your veterinarian injects into your, the skin of your animal so that for the rest of its life, if it ever gets lost, uh, anybody with a special kind of reader can get the, get the tag number without hurting your animal, can get the tag number and then uh, find out where, where, where that animal belongs. So we use the very same technology here. So that means that we inject the tags right under the skin and the terrapins. And then um, for the rest of that terrapin's life, that tag um, can be used, can be read with a, with a reader. Uh, so we can tell who that tag, who that, who that terrapin is. It's kind of like giving every animal uh, a name. And we, know, we now know the name of that animal anytime we catch it. Um, and they last forever, they don't, they don't wear out. Uh, so just like the one in your dog, your cat never wears out. How do we know where to put it? We put the, put the, put the tag in the same number in every single animal. So every animal gets a tag right under the skin, right near, near, right near one of the legs. So we always know where it is. Okay, so uh, Jim asked about, the, uh, about what climate change may do to um, uh, these turtles because they have temperature sex determination. Um, that's a great question and it's one that a lot of people who study turtles have explored. Um, and uh, we don't know for sure, but one thing we do know is that terrapins, like all turtles, can um, lay their eggs very close to the surface or they can lay them really deep. And the ones that are really deep are pretty protected from the sun. In other words, it doesn't get as warm when they're deep. And the ones that are really shallow get really warm. So to some level, it's possible that the terrapins can control how warm or how cold the egg, the nests are gonna be. Don't really know about that, but that, that may be what's going on. So, you know, we'll find out, and we're certainly very interested in that question. Okay, so Abby also wanted to know about what we're, what we're trying to do with terrapins and drones. Um, one of the ways that people count terrapins in an area is to go, to go out in an area with a kayak and just slowly go up and uh, around the marshes where the terrapins live and just count how many terrapins uh, they can see. And that's a pretty good technique, except we know, of course, terrapins are afraid of, of kayaks. And as soon as they see you're there, they dive underwater. And so you miss a lot of them. So what some people have suggested and that we're interested in following up on is flying drones over the marshes where the terrapins are. And you can see terrapins in the water if your drone is low enough. And also uh, the, the drones don't scare the terrapins nearly as much. And so we're really interested in exploring some of that. Um, but I'm altogether new with drones. So this is all new to me, but uh, I'm really excited about trying some of this. You guys have great questions. Yeah, Barbara says that the Cape Cod uh, terrapins are coming out of, uh, out of hibernation right now and they saw the first ones already. That's pretty exciting. Um, I'm sure that's going on here at Jamaica Bay as well. Okay, let's keep on going guys. Oh, Anna, great to hear from you as well. Okay, I'm gonna focus on the questions but it's great to get these comments from people, some people I know. So, um, this is really, really good. What does a turtle do if a raccoon breaks their egg? Well, remember the mom turtle is long gone uh, uh, by the time that happens. Moms lay their nests and then, and then run right back to the water. So they don't stick around at all. 
but if a, uh, but the, the baby terrapin that's inside the egg unfortunately dies uh, immediately if the eggs are broken open. So um, the raccoon is there to uh, eat the egg, and so they eat up the insides of the egg. The inside of a turtle egg is very much like the inside of a chicken's egg, so it, it's pretty much the same. Oh, yes, yeah, I said India. Wow, fantastic. When was the last time we found a new turtle? And I assume but what you mean by that uh, is uh, when's the last time we found a new nesting female? And we do find nesting females every single year. Um, uh, you know, we, you know we, we might catch 300 turtle nesting turtles in a year and maybe five or seven or 10 of them, maybe 12 of them are new. So we do get uh, new terrapins every year, but just not very many. Um, some of those new ones we get are, are probably new girls that are nesting for their first time. Certainly some of them are, are, are small and young, and so they're probably nesting for their first or second time. Some of them are still some girls that we've just never seen before. Maybe they've nested there for 20 years and we just never caught them before. So yeah, we still get new ones every time. Just not very many. Okay, oh, and a, and a, and a, uh, a message from uh, a listener in Sweden, that's wonderful. So we have, we have people listening from Sweden and from India, fantastic. Oh, what can we do to actively, what can we do to help the public I'm sorry, what can the public do to help care and take care of, of uh, uh, to protect turtles? Well, there's so many great organizations out there right now that are actively involved in turtle conservation. Um, and, um, uh, you know, there's, there's uh, you know, there's so many of them. There's uh, the uh, Turtle Survival Alliance. There's uh, uh, the, uh, the, the turtle, turtle Conservancy. There's lots and lots and lots of organizations out there that help with turtle uh, conservation. Um, I suggest that, you know, I don't know where you are. I'm, I'm talking to, uh, to uh, Flashbird here. I don't know where you are uh, in the country or where in the world you are, but every place there are people somewhere near you who are working on turtle conservation. And that's a great question to ask. And if you wanted to email me, I could probably help you find something local. But anybody who's interested in that, there are lots of places you can go. Many, many people are interested in helping out turtles. Um, so uh, Jimmy asked if it's possible that the low number of male hatchlings in the, in, uh, can come for um, and cause problems down the road. Um, that certainly is possible. Um, uh, I tend to doubt that that's a really big problem because um, uh, you know it doesn't take very many males to fertilize all the females in a population. So even if males are only a minority of the population, probably uh, the females find plenty of males when they need to. So um, I don't think that's likely to be a big problem, but it's certainly something we're going to want to keep track of. Okay, so Bev is asking, do you track migration based on what food is ingested? We've actually done quite a bit of work on their diets. I didn't talk much of anything about that here. Quite a bit about, uh, we've done a lot of work about uh, terrapin diets. And we know that um, the terrapins eat a pretty wide variety of things, different place, parts of the range, they eat whatever, uh, whatever uh, invertebrates are around that they can eat. Um, so the terrapins in Jamaica Bay are eating the things that are in Jamaica Bay, and the ones in other places are eating wherever, eating whatever is there where they are. So Tom is asking about yearling habitats. Really, really interesting question. Something we know a little bit about, just enough to tease, and I wish we knew so much more. So. In their very first winter, many of the hatchlings leave the nest and they go upland away from the water and dig a hole in the ground and bury themselves a couple of inches down and they wait out the first winter that way. In the, and the, uh, uh, then they come out of the ground in the next spring or summer and go down to the, to the water and they seem to spend most of that first couple of years in the low marsh, the marsh that floods when the tide comes in and might mostly drain out when the tide goes out. Um, and they feed on um, small invertebrates in there, but they're really hard to work with at that stage, and so we don't know all that much about them. Uh, Cassie wants to know what the male turtles do when the females are nesting. Well, the males and the females uh, only are interested in each other during the mating time. So when the females take off to go nest, the males, I'm sure, are paying no attention to that at all. They are busily feeding themselves and looking for females that might want to mate. So I don't think they have any trouble keeping occupied while the females are nesting. I was thinking about getting them assessed. I'm saying, sorry, say it again. No, oh, I missed, I missed, uh, I missed that. Um, 
Okay, so let's see, I, I've got a question from Henry here. Did I have another one before that? Uh, oh, Flashburg is in Harlem. Okay, <laughs> thank you, Flashburg. Um, yeah, we got lots of organizations here in New York, so uh, there's just no problem finding uh, folks uh, to get involved with the turtle conservation locally. Okay, uh, Henry asked about uh, integrating the studies with GIS. Um, and um, interesting you should ask that because um, one pro new project we have going on right now that I didn't talk about at all is we've started putting um, what you could call transmitters on the back of some of our terrapins with the idea that they'll transmit their locations to satellites and we'll be able to uh, uh, track them as they move around the bay. And uh, certainly there's a big GIS component to that. Um, and we'll see, um, we'll see uh, where, where that leads us. But yeah, I suspect you're getting interested in GIS and thinking about it along those lines. There's some other applications as well, but that's the main one that comes to mind. Uh, Callie asked about genetic differences between those populations. Um, we haven't, uh, we've done a little bit of exploration of that. I suspect the genetic differences are going to be very, very minor. Um, and that's because there's still some exchange between those two populations, even at a low level. Probably enough to keep the uh, genetic, the genetic differences from any serious genetic differences from occurring. But maybe over time, that's what's going to happen. Okay, Steve says uh, he's been counting terrorism for sea talk. That's a, that's a really, really good thing to do. Um, and CTOC has a number of other terrapin conservation uh, uh, program, uh, projects going on. And, um, and, uh, and I'm sure that John Turner there would be happy to, uh, to direct you at other projects. Uh, kudos to you, though, for, for doing that. And, um, and uh, man, kayakers are, are, uh, have, have a lot to contribute there. So uh, uh, that's, a, that's a fantastic, uh, a fantastic skill set. I'm glad you're helping out. Okay, what can be done with the ruler's bar population? Well, I wish I could say that um, I knew exactly what was going on there and why that population is doing so badly. Um, and, you know, 20 years of study, and I really don't have an answer to that just yet. But um, I think, um, you know, I think we're, we're going to continue doing what we're doing and see if we can't learn what's going on, uh, uh, you know, by following our trapping efforts. I think that that may help us a lot. And in a year or two, we'll have some answers from the pollution front, and maybe we'll be able to answer some of those questions. Yep, so uh, let's go on here. Yeah, there's lots of things you can do for conservation. You can recycle, you can pick up trash, you can uh, try to minimize how much uh, we're uh, using uh, our cars. There's just lots and lots of things we can do to uh, help, um, uh, help uh, uh, conserve uh, turtles and, and, and other wildlife. Okay, we're doing pretty well here. Okay, all right, very good. Did I answer all the questions? Wow, I'm impressed. Okay, so, um, uh, so that's fantastic. Um, <laughs> uh, Flashberg wants to know what to do about, uh, what to do with a, a pet diamondback terrapin. Well, I gotta tell you that um, according to uh, state law, uh, if you've got a terrapin, you should have a permit to keep it. You're not allowed to keep them without permits. So um, that would be the first place to start is to make sure that you, uh, what you're doing is, is perfectly okay. So um, I've got an ex a question from somebody. Does anybody have any advice on what to do if you're interested in a career in biology? Um, well, the thing to do there um, is, um, you, know, you, know, you know the story. The story. Uh, study hard, learn a lot about terrapin, learn a lot about whatever uh, wildlife you're interested in, and devote yourself to a cause. You know, that's, that's, uh, that's the best way, I think, to be a success. Um, uh, if you've got a problem with uh, a pet turtle or, a, um, or an injured terrapin, um, you, uh, I suggest that you uh, talk to a, a, a rehabber. There's a number of turtle rehabilitators here in the area, and, um, and they can help you out. And if you, um, if you look at the website for the New York Turtle and Tortoise Society, uh, they'll direct you to a rehabilitator who can help you out with, um, uh, with any problems you've got along those lines. Oh, so Genesis finally is on the, on, the, on the board here. She wants to know what will make a turtle a terrapin. So um, I'm going to use the answer that question the way any typical American would answer that question. Um, and I will freely acknowledge that people in other parts of the world would answer it differently. Um, all the reptiles that have shells are turtles. That means that a sea turtle is a sea turtle, is a turtle, a box turtle is a turtle, a, uh, a, uh, a Galapagos tortoise is a turtle, everybody, all those guys are turtles. Um, however, uh, we reserve the word terrapin for one particular species, and that is the diamondback terrapin, the one that I'm talking about here. 
other parts of the world use the word terrapin more broadly to apply to other turtles, but we only use it for one species. So diamondback terrapins are our only terrapins. Okay, guys, um, we're a little bit past our time here, um, and I'm going to wrap it up. If anybody's got any further questions, um, please feel free to email me. I'd be happy to try to answer your questions or direct you to someone who can. I really appreciate um, uh, you joining me today, and I hope you learned something, and, um, and uh, I hope uh, everybody stays safe and stays healthy.